Hello everyone and welcome to this video. My name is Fahad Alevi and today I'm going to explain how to use integration tests in your Azure CI pipeline. To cover that one, we need to have a better understanding about the test and test pyramid. I have another video and I explain test pyramid and integration test. I would put the link here, but I'm going to explain it because without understanding the test pyramid, you don't know where and when use each of the testing methods. The first thing that we have is unit tests. Yeah. Then we have integration test, we have end-to-end -end test, and we have user acceptance test. As the volume suggests, the number of the unit tests that you should create should be more than integration test. And the number of the integration tests that you have should be way more than the end-to-end -end test. And user acceptance test, you should have just 10 or 11 of them. Unit test is a kind of test that you test a method. You should test the smallest unit of your code. For integration tests, you test a process. You pick methods in a process from first method until the last method inside your application and you just test it. In some cases, you need to test the connectivity of your application to some infrastructure components or to some other applications. And in end-to-end -end testing, you are just simulate a real word user behavior. I mean, you are going to test the whole application. You are going to test the application from the UI that end user sees and just get the responses. And user acceptance test is a real world testing. We usually do the user acceptance test on the acceptance environment before swapping acceptance and production. I used AI to generate this image and it shows a lot. We have a fancy car, we have a fancy steering wheel, we have a fancy seat, dashboard, everything. Each of them, each of the modules by itself is fancy and perfect. But when you put them all and assemble all inside the car, you know, the car is not usable. Each module can work independently, but in total, it is useless. It is the place that integration test works you should pick one story and test it from beginning to end. When should we write unit tests? When all the tests are green. And we are going to make sure that module can work together as a whole. As I told you, we need to pick just one user story and let all the modules inside our application to call each other. And sometimes you need to test the border components as well, the components or infrastructure components that you have outside of your application. And you need to be sure that your application can make this connection to the database. You are not writing integration tests to test something outside of your application. I saw a lot of integration tests that developers started testing something which is not inside their application. The team who is responsible for creating this database, they wrote their own unit test and you should just trust them. By border components that I said, I mean something like the files, network and databases. If you have a process like that, if you have an execution plan like this, that you have one API endpoint, you have authentication, business layer, and uh, maybe response formatter, you need to just pick one process. You need to pick one flow and mock the rest of the things that you have. Traditionally, we have development, test, acceptance, and production environment. We call them DTAP. If you are working in a highly regulated sector like financial sector, you may be asked to create all these development, test, acceptance, and production environments. And we have IDE and CI pipeline inside the development. And then you have aesthetic analysis tools, the warnings that Visual Studio itself gives you. Or maybe when you run the CI pipeline, the warning that you see there, or maybe you have some other static analysis tools for the security or code quality inside your pipeline. You can and you should run unit tests both on your IDE and your CI pipeline. And then you have integration tests on your IDE. We have two types of integration tests. The first type, you can run them on your own machine because they are not dependent to the border components or infrastructure. You can test one process from beginning to end on your machine because it doesn't have any dependency or you can mock it. But you need to deploy the code to the test environment and then you can run the integration test which is related 
to the border components because you may not have Kafka installed on your own machine. You may not have blob storage on your machine. You may not have SQL Server installed on your machine. Then you need to have an environment. And by environment, I mean a lot of virtual machines, app services, or things like that. And just God knows how much should you spend on this test environment. After everything are green and all your tests are passed on the test environment, you push your code using the CD pipeline to the acceptance environment in acceptance environment you usually run the end-to-end -end test we have two approaches to run the user acceptance test on acceptance and then swap the environments or push the code to the production and run the user acceptance tests but you should be careful when you are writing integration tests because if you can test a behavior using integration test and unit test you should choose the unit test and you should limit the usage of the integration test to the most important scenarios or if i want to rephrase it if you have so many tables and you are manipulating the data inside the tables in several api controllers just pick one because if you can change one table in your database then you can almost be sure that you can edit update delete all the tables in your application and all programming languages support to run unit tests using a web host or in-memory test server. We have Web Application Factory in .NET. If you can use it, use it and run your integration test on your local machine. Then use in-memory server on your IDE and do not use test environment. The reason that I am going to use integration test in the CI pipeline is to get rid of this test environment you can save some thousands of euros every year or maybe if you are working in a big organization you can save some million euros as you can see integration tests are just in ide and test environment but we want to get rid of this test environment and run it through the ci pipeline and how to do that really easy using docker and test containers test containers let you to bring up all your border components in a docker container and test your code against the containers it is really good as well because if you are working in a big organization and you have a lot of other products and your application is a consumer of other APIs that you generated or created in your company, you can just test your code against the specific version of that API that you containerized previously. Let's see the modules that test container has by default. I just put some images of the common modules that you can use. You should not be limited to these libraries and classes because you can easily create your own class. For example, if you have an API somewhere in your organization and you want to run your test and integration test against that API, you can create one test container for that project really easy you just need to copy one of these projects from their github account and change the base image okay as you can see here we have mongodb we have ms sql server even we have kafka but how it works on my local machine i have one windows 10 installed and then inside my machine i have dotnet sdk installed this dotnet sdk is responsible for getting the code running the code and run my test when i try to run my test using test containers the first thing that my dotnet compiler does is to run this test container as you can see here we are running the test container and after the test container is responsible to bring up a docker and on my machine, I have Docker Desktop installed and my Docker daemon is based on a Linux operating system. I have WSL2 enabled on my machine, which enables me to run Linux on one Windows operating system. Docker is running good. And after that, it tries to pull the Ryuk container or Ryuk image from Docker Hub. This Ryuk is a kind of um, lifecycle manager for the rest of the containers and images that you have. Ryuk 
enables you to send some request to it using TCP and ask it to run some images, get some images, or maybe delete some containers. Using this Ryu container, you can pull the latest version of the MSSQL server and then you can start running it. By running the Ryuk, you can run the SQL server and execute your tests against the container that you have. If you haven't seen my project about how to run it, the actual code, you can check my video that I created about that and I put the code inside my Git repository. After everything, after all the tests are passed or failed, my test container module will ask the Ryuk to terminate all the containers that it has. Remove the MSSQL server container and Ryuk is going to remove itself. Let's go to the code and see it. It is the example of the code that we can have. We are going to run the test container and build it. We are using the MSSQL Builder class here, which is going to request for one Linux based MSSQL server. And then inside the configuration web host, because this specific integration test is going to use in memory server. And we just need to run this MSSQL server container and replace the connection string. You can use this underscore DB container that get connection string and just replace the injection that you had in your application configuration. And eventually after changing this connection string, you will run the container here. But how it works? Let's go back to the previous slide. We need to understand what is behind the scene. Here is my Docker desktop. And in my Docker desktop, I have a Docker daemon. You can imagine that Docker daemon is responsible for almost executing everything, run all the images. It is not 100% correct, but it is correct enough. And then you have a file. On your Linux operating system, you have var run docker.sock. This docker.sock is a file which is Docker daemon listen to. If you change something inside that file, Docker daemon is going to listen to that and apply the changes to the Docker engine. Okay, but why do we need to know this .sock file? Because the way that we are going to implement this method on our Azure CI is Docker wormhole. Docker wormhole is a way that lets us run a Docker container and inside that Docker container start creating some other containers and pulling some other images. Let's explain it in more detail in the next slide. This is my build agent on Azure CI. As you can see here, the operating system for this build agent is Linux then it is not Windows anymore. You can install .NET SDK on a build agent, but I highly recommend you not to do that. We have a Docker installed on that operating system based on Linux, and this is the only difference that we have. The main operating system for the build agent is Linux. But when we don't have .NET SDK installed on the machine itself, on the OS itself, how can we run it? Because as I told you, .NET is responsible for running the test and then test container will be called. Docker verb holding help us here because I can create one container, one image, which has the .NET SDK base image and get all my codes and put it inside this image, then run it. Then I have an image with .NET SDK and I put my code here and now I try to run this image, create a container, and inside that container, I'm going to run my test. The reason I need to have .NET SDK is that test framework is a part of SDK, not runtime. And now inside one container, we need to create other containers. You may think that we are creating an infinity loop because we are creating a container inside a container and we are going to create another container inside the other container. Wow, it's mind blowing, but it is not how it works. We have a container and this container is running inside my Docker. And by communicating using this var run docker.sock, we can ask the Docker host to create some other containers for me and run them. It was the reason that I told you when you are going to run it, you need to pass the volume dash V. Can you remember? Because I just wanted to map the 
Docker sock file that I have inside this container to the Docker sock file that I have on the host. And then I made a change into this Docker sock file inside my .NET container. It is going to reflect on the container that I have, the host container, which means that if we try to pull something here, it will reflect my Docker engine and my Docker engine is going to pull this image for us. And after that, it is really easy. You can just pull it and this Ryuk is going to pull the MS SQL server for you and then it is going to run it for you. Let's go to one screenshot of the previous video that we had. As you can see here, it is running my test. The reason that I created this video is you need to know how things happen. Because if you want to explain it to one of your colleagues, you need to know what is happening. If you cannot support your ideas in your organization, you cannot get anyone's approval. If you like this video, please hit the like button and please subscribe to my channel. And by pressing the bell, you will get notified every time that I upload another video to my channel. In the next video, I'm going to explain how to use this method inside your organization. If you have a Nexus server or some other repositories for your Docker images, and if you cannot have access directly from your organization to Docker Hub, then do not miss it.